Hello everyone, welcome to SBE Podcast, the place where we share interesting ideas of interesting people. My name is Yunus and I'll be the host um, starting today. I'm replacing Louis. Um, I'm a 21-year-old bachelor student, second year here at uh, SBE. I study economics and business with international business specialization. Um, and today I'm here with Stefan. Um, Stefan Flagner, you're a, a PhD student at SBE, but not only SBE. So um, you're in a very unique position because you're doing a dual PhD at SBE and FHML. Stefan, um, welcome to the podcast. To start off, maybe you can um, share your, um, your, your journey to um, yeah, how you came to this dual PhD position. Yeah, thank you very much, Eunice. Thanks also for not uh, saying my age. That is highly appreciated. So as you said, I'm Stefan. I'm a PhD, joint PhD, so 50% at the School of Business and Economics. They are part of the uh, finance department, specifically of the Maastricht Center for Real Estate. But I'm also 50% at the Faculty of Health, Medicine and Life Science. And they are part of the Nutrition and Movement Science Department. Yeah, so two very different fields. Um, how how does that work? How does your um, yeah day to day life as a researcher look like? You uh, you have two offices. You told me mm. um, you get up. Um, how does a day for a dual PhD look like? Well, not different than a normal PhD, right? <laughs> Except for the difference that I have to decide to which building I have to go, or maybe switch during the day during the building maybe to uh, to explain a little bit where that comes from is that um, that this whole position was made because master's university figured out the, or specifically also my supervisors figured out the need to have research fields not by faculty or by field like a business or a health faculty uh, a phd but more by topics and depending on that topic, they decided, well, what are the people, what are the expertises we need for that certain topic, which is in my regards, we have people from health science and we have people from business. We also have economists. We even have an engineer all coming together. Not everybody of my supervisor is even at Master's University. So apart from that one, I, walk, I wake up as every normal PhD, I guess. I don't know how other PhDs are waking up, but at least I know how I wake up. And then I know that either I have some work at one faculty or the other one, depending on which, which studies I'm working on at the moment. Yeah. Um, later on, I want to talk a bit about um, yeah, what you said with this shift from um, different disciplines to more topic-related research, interdisciplinary teams. But um, maybe before that, we can... Um, yeah, dive a, dip, um, a bit deeper into your background. So mm -hmm. you um, you did your bachelor also at Maastricht University, right? No, no, I did it in Germany, actually, in Mannheim. Ah, that's oh. close to my hometown uh, in, ah, in Heidelberg. That's nice. Um, and that was a, um, a finance bachelor? or what That was actually an economics bachelor. So, uh, which is also interesting because I did I did two masters yeah. and both masters I did here in Maastricht, but I indeed did my bachelor in Germany. So I had three, three and a half years of, um, yeah, of experience in how education is working outside of Maastricht, outside of the PBL system, which until today is still very valuable for me yeah. because I see the differences. I only yesterday actually um, finished the university teaching qualification course, which is like a nationwide course in Netherlands, um, where you talk a lot about the principles also of PBL, the principle of teaching and good education in general. And I really saw the differences between um, between the German-based system, the lecture-based system compared yeah. to BBL. So I did my economics bachelor here. I did a sustainable finance master here that was in 2017, 2018. Started to also work then as a consultant in Luxembourg because that was normally the career path which if you do this kind of business which you want to go to. But I kind of figured out during my, my time in Luxembourg that something is missing for me at least or it, it, it doesn't really fit. And luckily because Maastricht is so nice to kind of have this interdisciplinary spirit, I could come back, do a second master, but then at the FHML, at the health faculty, 
where they also allowed me to join even that I didn't have a bachelor in, in health science. I could show that I know enough statistical knowledge and I'm motivated enough to come. And I was not the only one who came with different backgrounds there, did the second uh, master and then uh, the PhD position popped up and that's two and a half years ago. And wow. within that PhD, they, they wanted to have somebody who combines health science or who has some knowledge in, in health um, and has some knowledge in economics and finance. And luckily that that is me. Yeah. So uh, I applied for that one and now I'm sitting here. Yeah. Wow. I, I remember we um, during the pre-discussion, we briefly talked how um, yeah, you wrote an email to the professor, I believe, mm -hmm. um, because the entry requirements at first weren't open to um, business um, business students, mm -hmm. and how that door then then opened for you. Right? Yeah, the interesting part is that so this was the 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 master is called work, health, and career, mm -hmm. which is basically occupational health management. So learning a lot about how to keep your employees healthy, how to keep them fit in the long run. Sustainable employability is one of the big terms there. Uh, very good master. Um, but for the requirements, you should have a bachelor in health science or biomedical science or physiotherapy, which I clearly didn't have. Um, yeah. So I applied for it. The admission office also did their job and basically said, okay, this person doesn't uh, fulfill the requirements so we cannot take them. But I was a bit more persistent in terms of sending an email to the professor, to the course coordinator and said, well, I'm aware that I don't have that knowledge, but I am motivated. I really want to do it. Um, I also have statistical knowledge. So in terms of knowing how research works, I know it from my, from my master and bachelor. And he was open to, to still get me. And only two weeks ago, I figured out that I was actually not the only one, but within this master work health and career, there are quite some people who had different backgrounds and still could, could get in, which showed for me a little bit that the, the, the normal thinking of universities, of their certain requirements, and if people don't know this knowledge, they cannot do it. It's kind yeah. of contradicting the spirit of, of Maastricht, right? Of the PBL system of if you're motivated enough, yeah. then you can sit down, you can learn it, and other people benefit also from your knowledge. Yeah. I mean, sure, the um, PBL system at its core is a bit interdisciplinary, right? We, it uh, mirrors um, how in the future in the corporate world um, we work in teams with people with different backgrounds to tackle challenges that in the mm -hmm. nature will always have different components. So whether it's science or um, yeah, business economics. Um, but I think... This your your journey, your story resonates with a lot of students, um, myself included. I think when I um, applied for this bachelor, I also wasn't sure: do I want to go uh, business and economics? Is this the right thing for me? Mm -hmm. um, I had a bit of a passion also for science and tech, and to those students who um, yeah who consider having multiple passions, which probably everyone has. Um, is there some piece of advice or looking back on your journey um, that you'd like to share? Hmm. So I'm, I'm still on a journey to answer that question, yeah. that's for sure. So I, when I think about how I was in my bachelor when I was 19, 20, 21, I really had this idea of if you just find your passion and what you really love, then you can you can easily work hard. Yeah. That was at least my thinking. And you see a lot of back in the days, you find a lot of YouTube videos and books who basically tell you that. Nowadays, I think it's it's not that easy. And it was maybe a bit naive to think like that. Because I think I have found, I'm pretty sure, especially with, with physiology, I have found something which I really like. But I also started to like what I learned and what I know in finance and to really value value that one. And still that I like that doesn't, or that I have my passion doesn't mean that suddenly it, it's easy and I can wake up at 5.30 every mm -hmm. morning and I'm motivated to do that. Because what I learned is that passion is not everything. It's at the end, you, so there's a good book from, from Carl Newport, which is called, um, I think the title is So Good They Can't Ignore You. And basically what the book says, in essence, is that 
you can generate passion for something, even if you don't have the passion at the beginning, by becoming really good in it, right? So there is a difference between I'm passionate in something, I want to play piano, but I'm really bad in it. Mm -hmm. Or there is something where maybe I don't like it so much, but I become so good and so skilled in that one that I start to actually like that. And that made me a little bit thinking of what's the value of passion is maybe the question, what is your passion, the wrong question. And maybe the right question should be, what are you good in? What are your natural skills? Mm -hmm. So don't force yourself to do something which doesn't fit your skills, but develop the skills you already have. Yeah. Um getting to know who we are as people, what are uh, what are we good at in the context of exploring our passion. Um, which is um, interesting, right? If you um, if, if you start this, um, a, a bachelor in, in science, right? And we have all these skills that you need to learn. Was this something where you were, um, you felt, okay, um, research, designing studies, um, is this something you had to learn there or were you already absolutely good at it? no so absolutely you there did you feel passionate in the beginning then or i i felt blessed that's a different thing i felt blessed i mean you have to understand that i was working in luxembourg i had a really good job there i had a permanent contract um i i i had a good salary right there was no like on paper, objectively, there was no reason to quit that job, yeah. right? It was a huge bet, a huge risk I yeah. took to say, I go and I become again a student for yeah. a second master even in a field which occupational health management is maybe there are less job opportunities compared to studying business or economics. It was a huge risk. And I just felt blessed at, and thankful at the beginning that there are some professors who trusted me to... to to do some work, especially the, the, the physiology side, right? Yeah. My professors here from finance and economics, they knew me already from my master, from my f sustainable finance master. They kind of knew apparently that I'm quite good. But the physiology people, they didn't knew everything, anything from me. They just, they just saw I have a little bit of some health stuff in my CV. It's not really, it's not hardcore biomedical science, right? So they just basically trusted me that I will learn that stuff. And that is, for me, a feeling of being thankful for yeah. their trust, right? But also a big responsibility, which is different than just passion. The passion maybe helped me to convince them that I want to do it, but it was more this feeling of I have a chance, I feel blessed to have a chance, but also the feeling of I have a responsibility to live, to deliver and fulfill this trust, which kept me going afterwards. Were there... Um because for me, it's hard to imagine um, all this, um, like without having a, a bachelor in biomedical sciences or so, how, how can you learn all these skills so, so fast, right? Uh, research design, mm. physiology, uh, you spoke. Uh, later on, we'll uh, look at your research and what you actually um, do and a few of your studies. Um, it's about learning mostly, how our surroundings influence mm. our learnings. Um, so a lot of also neurobiology um how 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 fast can you learn all of this um if you're passionate of course but um did you have the resources mm. did you um uh, learn this once you started your ma uh, your masters or was there like introductory courses mm. how can you imagine this process well what you have to oh, the first thing is to be humble because yeah, I do a PhD also in a health faculty, but let's be honest, I am far away from having the same knowledge as my colleagues who actually studied that for three or four years. The knowledge, there is a difference between the plain knowledge and the understanding of that, putting things in terms of biology into perspective. It's the same with if you would have a health scientist come into business, of course you can teach this person in half a year or a year the basic principles of auditing or of um, evaluating a stock right but it takes more to to understand how the whole field is thinking how it is learning and and what that means and there i'm still not there so i had to be humble enough to understand that these people know more 
what I did for concrete steps was, um, first of all, getting textbooks, basically sitting down. So I did my first lab study, right, where I was basically forced to learn principles of physiology. I need to be I needed to learn how is the lung working, uh, what is homostasis in the body, what does it what does it mean, how, how does the body react physiologically, what what is the, it from the basic principles of what is the normal heart rate, what is the normal blood pressure, all these things which other people already know, and I needed to sit down, get my textbook, and just read the things, read the same stuff. That's the first thing I did. And the second thing is I started to teach these things. So I started to teach a course, m several courses in biomedical science, the bachelor first year courses. And while I was teaching these, I was starting to learn how is the brain structure, what's the brain anatomy, how does neurons work, which again I use with my textbooks. But at the end, it's just, I don't do the process differently than a bachelor student. I just mm -hmm. sat down and read the things in the textbook talked with people and kept in mind that many times I was thinking I understand it now and then half a year later I figured out which I didn't understand that so much yeah um, maybe we can now talk a bit about your your actual research um, you have a few studies going on um, mm -hmm. right now uh, three you mentioned uh, maybe you can talk a bit about these studies what they're about um, and then later on about this process of working in teams with different faculties. But first, um, would you like to share a few of those studies? Sure. So um, my research is about how the indoor environmental quality, and that is the light in the room, that's the temperature, the humidity level in the room. That's also the air quality, so carbon dioxide concentration, other air pollutants in the air. So basically how these factors within a room can impact your cognition. That was first the idea. Cognition in terms of the test scores of students, in terms of how well office workers can do their work or how well people in general can do mental tasks, right? But also health. But health in two regards. So health could be in terms of um, you have outcomes like... Uh, like obesity outcomes, like uh, respiratory sy syndromes, right? So if you have problems with your lungs and maybe they increase if the certain air, air quality is not so well. But also in terms of, if you talk about cognition, cognition is nothing else than another part of your biology, right? It's just other biological, physiological processes in your brain, in your body. So if you want to understand how these factors are affecting cognition, you need to understand how it impacts your body as a whole. So that was my approach of basically understanding that the, the human body is complex and you have to find different levels and different angles to look at that one. And that's where maybe the passion come into, is coming into place again because the passion comes in terms of when I see or when I talk about cognition goes down, I want to know what that means, right? I'm not satisfied with people can do score less in a memory task. I want yeah. to know what is happening in the human brain, in the body. How can we break it down to the to the lowest level of, of neuropsychology, of biology to understand, oh, if your memory goes down, it's because this happens. This is what I wanted to understand. And that yeah. keep me going to read the textbooks yeah. because I was not satisfied with just the answer of cognition goes down. And um, very concretely, um, can you uh, share with us like one study you're performing right now? Mm. So the, the f the, one of the big studies we did now where the data collection and the analysis is basically done is that we had a lab study a lab study means we had a controlled setting, we had a normal room with 20 participants, and we wanted to see how the carbon dioxide levels affect your cognition. And we also measured some physiological parameters like heart rate, blood pressure, respiration rate, skin temperature, to see, to find a mechanism of that, right? Um, why CO2? Why carbon dioxide? Because there is a lot of literature which connected high levels 
of carbon dioxide in a room with lower cognition, lower test scores of pupils, of students, or lower performance of office workers. But there are many different parts, not only carbon dioxide, there are also different air pollutants. Um, and the question in literature was, well, what is it actually? We see this connection of CO2 and reduced cognition, but is it CO2 itself? So that's when we did this, this lab study to figure out, well, if we remove all the air pollutants and only look at CO2, what is that actually doing? And then, of course, you build your hypothesis because you have to figure out what would you expect from a biological point of view, also based on past literature. You do the study. We did that. And um, now we know or we are confident enough to see that it looks like carbon dioxide itself, at least at the level of what we tested for eight hours, right? You always have to make these restrictions. Um, is not the main driver of reduced cognition, which is an int mm. which is like a perfect example of you don't get any results, and that's actually more interesting than if you would have gotten results. Wow. Um, do you have any idea what is the main driver, or is that content well, of future research? The, there is a lot of research about carbon dioxide, and so what happens normally is you reduce the ventilation rate of a room, And then carbon dioxide goes up because we humans, we exhale carbon dioxide. We are the main source of carbon dioxide at that level because outside carbon dioxide level also exists, but it's around 0.04%. It's not a lot. We talk about 0.3%, so very high, yeah. sometimes even 10 times that high. Um, Is that um, in a normal room, how, how much would that be? Um, Well, let's, if you would have a normal tutorial room with 16, 10, 12 yeah. students, after one, after, yeah, after two hours, you will get to levels of 0.2, 0.25% CO2, okay. which is way more than 0.04% outside, right? Yeah. But when you change the ventilation rate, there are also other particles, they call them, or the umbrella term is volatile organic compounds, which are other particles which you as a human are breathing out, are exhaling, but also particles um, which are maybe coming from the painting of the wall, from the building structure itself, from the carpet. So other air pollutants, while carbon dioxide is a gas itself. And these studies, they wanted to see what is low ventilation levels doing? So you have high CO2 and high volatile organic compounds. And then what is if only CO2 is high, but the rest is very low, right? And when both is high, so which is the more practical outcome, because that's what we have when we have reduced ventilation, they saw, they, many studies saw a strong effect on cognition. But when only CO2 is high, then they saw a less strong or even insignif insignificant effect, which, again, practically is not that interesting because you never have only CO2 very high yeah. and the rest very low, but it helps us researchers to understand that CO2 itself might not be the problem. Because later on, when we think about how do we optimally ventilate a room or maybe do we filter out pollutants we can now maybe try to understand that filtering out air pollutants and even that the CO2 level is very high maybe might be not a problem, Yeah. right? But if you would see that CO2 also has an effect, then we know that we also have to remove the CO2. So it's, it's our task as researchers, I think, to distangle the problem, right? Try to understand it in every, in every aspect and then bring it again back to what is the practical relevance for that. Yeah. Um, that's actually, for me, quite interesting, the, um, this research process um, where you work in, in interdisciplinary teams. You have F FHML uh, researchers. Mm. You're kind of in between uh, SBE. Um, have you noticed a, a difference in mindset, a difference in tackling problems, in uh, perceiving the world and having, uh, yeah, expectations? Uh. So that is absolutely, I've seen differences and similarities. Okay. And that's the more interesting part. So I um, organized a workshop 
for my team at the business faculty and also the team at the health science, where basically we presented our studies. And at the end of this seven, eight hour workshop, it was a full day, one of my uh, professors at the FHML, Professor Guy plus Guy, he basically said, well, we are working on the same thing, even that we use different terms and we come from different angles. But it's the same thing we are working on. So you have economists, you have um, also public health science people who have most of the time big, large data sets, right? And they're trying to find correlations, associations, maybe even longitudinal effects of these big, large, large data sets. And in order to figure out that there is a causality going on, you need a bunch of different control factors, right? Because it's a big data set, there is a lot of noise. So you you want to make sure from a statistical point of view with different robustness checks that you really checked and it really seems to be that this one parameter affects your outcome. While for medical papers, for clinical studies, they do it beforehand by controlling a lot, right? So in my lab study, I put people into a chamber for eight hours. So I controlled what they eat. I controlled what they drink. I made sure they don't, how I, I gave them restrictions, how they have to come to, to work, um, to, to the lab, right? I told them don't come by bike or don't come running, don't do any physical activity because one outcome was energy expenditure. I told them to sleep normally. But I could even come, let them come a day before and control their sleep. Mm. So their thinking is we don't need very, we don't need these kinds of statistical models. We just control beforehand for that. So if we see an effect, we know that this effect most likely comes from this one factor which we changed because everything else was the same. Temperature was the same, light conditions was the same, food was the same, always the same. The thinking is different, but the question they, they want to investigate is the same. And I can imagine, um, yeah, working in teams, um, not only perhaps research design, but um, perception of the things we want to research and uh, what we focus on um, can be completely different, right? You, um, you think of different things based on the context of your um, <coughs> background. Is there some striking, um, something that comes to your mind where you were like really aware of your mm -hmm. SBE thinking perhaps or your FHML thinking or where you had a experience of, um, yeah, getting, getting a new like paradigm shift or mm. perspective? Yeah, so when I did my second master in work health and career I did my master thesis at the epidemiology department and one of my professors there Nicole Jansen she basically told me so I was tending to do a regression analysis and say there is an effect and she said be careful it's an association an effect would include already that there is a there is a cause relationship right yeah. and that's where I got aware that in my opinion, economists, for example, sometimes too quickly, too easy, talk about an effect. Mm -hmm. Because they think we did all the statistical knowledge, we have did all the statistical analysis, we found this, if this, this correlation, it has to be an effect. Where maybe health scientists would say, well, we don't believe that, right? Because we want to control everything. On the other hand, Clinical studies have, for example, a way lower sample size, which is, so my sample size of a lab study was 20 people, which is, which economists would ask you, how do you get significant results with 20 people? And then I have to explain them where we controlled for everything. We had a crossover design, so the same person came, came twice um, to show them that we don't need that much of a sample size. But obviously, also health scientists have to be very careful with generalizing these results, right? Yes, I have 20 people. Yes, I controlled for everything. Yes, they came two times. But again, it's, it's 20 people where maybe I still have a bias of 
very smart people and that's why it get no uh, relation to cognition right um, or I cannot say anything about people with a certain disorder with respiratory symptoms with asthma I cannot say anything about people with a cognitive disorder right so that generalizability is different while the economist optimally has a big data set and he can easily stratify so you can easily have subpopulation where you say okay now I look at only the normal children compared to the children with a high BMI and then I want to see and what I was thinking is that so I was thinking about an order right what comes first the lab study and then you go to the field study or is it more you find something in a field study outside and then you go to the lab to understand it and now I think they 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 support each other right so the economist has a very good view of a big field study he finds an effect or an association there right and then he wants to understand why what is going on in the in the human body we want to we want to have the exact mechanism then we can say there is an effect so he goes to the lab well maybe in the lab you find an effect but you don't know how to generalize it so what do you do you go and have a big data set and you look do we find the same one outside maybe we don't find it outside and then the question is why so you need both you need both scales um yeah um that's an actually interesting point um but would you would you say there's um something yeah let's say um uh something that where, where you would say okay this is something we can really learn from um from the other side fhml or from spe something uh that you wish because if if i look back at my my early courses um i remember um before coming to maastricht i was um more in the kind of tech and science bubble mm. um i was always thinking very um yeah a bit too complex maybe and then when i arrived in maastricht we had our first economic models uh, i was surprised by how simple they were how how we um take very few variables and yet they have a high um yeah power of of describing the world right whereas in in medical studies i feel like it is much more um all these different factors are taken into account whereas in economics we say okay we only focus now on on this um disposable income and uh price levels and whatnot um and this was something that was quite hard for me to um learn this a bit simpler mm -hmm. um simpler understanding and more intuitive thinking perhaps is this something that could help um medical research on the other side could medical research uh economic research benefit from from the um taking more variables of economic uh, of medical models mm. so i think w what health scientists <laughs> and i mean I'm I'm just a PhD. Yeah. There are people who are in this field for 20 years so I have to I have to say that's completely my opinion and I'm pretty sure not in a position to say okay this is what every health scientist have to learn from a business person. Um so this is just my humble opinion about that. But I think um, what health scientists could learn from the business people is um especially a greater toolbox in statistics in in i mean the the there are they they use sometimes simpler statistical models but because they are simpler they also reduce the the implications they could derive from their results while for you know it if you study economics if you even study econometrics um the the level of of statistics you get there is in my perception higher compared wow. to compared to a health science one what i have seen at least i yeah. i could be wrong about that um so that's what they could learn on the other side what the business people 
could learn from the health science people is to not be too quick in coming to conclusions. Because within health science, there also there are sometimes people or research groups come into come to quick conclusions and then 10 years later they figured out that this is actually not how the human body works right in in exercise physiology for example in the effect of endurance sports on uh, many parameters of your health there were some thoughts and dogmas 20 30 years ago or we know now this is this is, doesn't make sense. This is wrong. But even within the normal population, these dogmas still stick because you have this YouTube fitness people who tell you the bro science stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so that's something to take into account, maybe. And um, we talked a lot now about your research at FHML. Um, do you have some interesting findings that relate to the SBE side of perhaps learning or um, economic implications of your research? Mm -hmm. Well, the economic implications are... So the reason why my PhD exists is that we we need to reduce carbon emissions, right? We yeah. need to combat climate change. Um, and the real estate sector is one of the biggest sector of carbon emissions most of the or like a major part of energy consumption is coming from heating buildings cooling buildings ventilation rates let it be uh, let it be offices let it be commercial real estate let it be houses right so my or the, there was a move towards sustainable buildings the Tapain Kazani here what you know, Mass University did is a perfect example right so they tried to make create buildings which are very energy efficient but in a way to not compromise the health of the occupants so that the people who are sitting inside still had a very high level of well-being could perform very well are healthy are not affected by that right um, and my research is going exactly into this field to understand what is an optimal indoor environment optimal in terms of yeah, your peak performance, cognitive performance, physical performance, peak health, right? And how can we achieve that by not crazily increasing the energy um, expenditure, the, you know, yeah, the, the, the energy costs of, yeah. of the building itself? So this is a practical implication for that. And then what I see in the field is that also there in the field of, of, of business and of this real estate, there are also sometimes just assumptions made from from various practitioners in that field um, which a health scientist would clearly tell you well either it's wrong or it's not so easy it's, it's not how the human body works because there is there is no communication between these two fields right there is no communication between these two sides yeah so um, if you look at the future, uh, the future of research will have to be interdisciplinary, probably. Um, Maastricht University is already going yeah, a very big step in that direction uh, with programs like yours. But I think the general spirit of Maastricht is also quite interdisciplinary. Mm. Um, one thing that I found quite interesting was, um, yeah, if, if you look at Silicon Valley um, in Stanford, they founded a new faculty, a new school of sustainability, which um, yeah, was founded to tackle uh, climate change. Um, and this is, I believe, the first big and well-funded faculty um, that is at its core interdisciplinary, that has um, um, that purpose uh, is not to research economics or, uh, or science uh, or health science, but to tackle a problem, a challenge, mm. and in doing so, takes researchers and scholars from all these different fields. How would the university of the future, your optimal university, look like, and the future of education and learning, um, keeping in mind your background of um, yeah, combining PhDs and also your knowledge about learning capabilities? Mm. So two things here. Um, number one, I think we, 
I think universities move, maybe a little, need to move away from this field and faculty thinking. This is the business faculty, this is the health science faculty, and more towards topics, towards we have the faculty for climate change, we have the faculty for health and children. And then they basically get people from different sites coming there, right, and bringing their knowledge together. So I think that has to happen. On the other side, I can understand the need that if you want to become good in something and really understand something, you need to focus for quite a while on that one, right? So what what is, doesn't make sense to see is that you would have somebody who studies, let's say, at the faculty of climate change, and then he has a little bit of business here, a little bit of economics there, a little bit of health yeah. science there, a little bit of engineering here, because then he, he has a broad understanding, right? But he doesn't have a very deep understanding. Yeah. And that's, for example, that's my, exp that's my own experience. I'm not a very good economist. I'm not a ge very good physiologist. I have a very broad understanding and I can bring it together. But I always need people who are very deep experts in economics, very deep experts in physiology. I can be the bridge, but I need the specialist. Yeah. So it has to be both. Only doing one or either, that won't work. In terms of learning for, f for the future students or like for general, I think, knowledge workers, office workers nowadays, what is important is the ability to quickly learn new things. Because I think the time of our parents where you learn one thing and you yeah. do this job for 40 years and then you retire, it's not like that anymore. You have to be able to quickly adapt to be able to, to learn because also the technological advantage is just like higher and with a, with a higher pace, right? So you have to be able to say, okay, I studied for five years business now, but I have this topic, so I have to learn this thing about engineering, which is completely new. Well, I need to sit down, which is basically lifelong learning, right? Yeah. And this is what Master University also understood and offers not only to students, but also to executives with their ex executive teaching program. Yeah. Yeah, um, next week we'll have a episode or we'll record an episode about uh, AI and chat GPT. And this shows again how um, knowledge is just yeah, made obsolete um, so quickly because we have research going on um, and we need to focus perhaps more on as, um, yeah, instead of learning hard knowledge, um, as knowledge becomes available everywhere, um, being able to filter out knowledge to put it into context and um, yeah to to handle fake fake knowledge and have this research um, yeah this criteria hmm. and I think um, for me this is something um, where I'm uh, yeah what we learn at university especially at a bachelor level okay we learn economics we learn a mindset of thinking of tackling problems but uh, we also learn how to how to learn fast we have tutorials where we have to prepare something read uh, 20 pages 40 pages of a book uh, in a few days then go into a tutorial with 12 people and mm. um, have no lecture um, but discuss it and teach it ourselves which was or can be challenging but ultimately at its core is about learning how to learn and how to adapt very quickly. Hmm. So this, I believe, is also yeah, quite very val valuable at Maastricht University compared to, if you look at the German system, perhaps at uh, Mannheim. Um, but I'm curious how this would apply to um, other other fields. In in business, perhaps this is doable, but in, in research where you do need... Um, like you mentioned, uh, for, for this hypothetical school of climate change rather than uh, faculty of business, um, you do need highly specialized people to form a well-rounded class rather than have to have well-rounded people form a well-rounded class, right? Hmm. Yeah, the thing is... Um it depends. So, in in the university teacher qualification course, when we 
we learned something about teaching design, so how to teach, how to design a certain course, right? And what one of the basic principles we learned is it depends on the learning goal. It depends yeah. on which skill does somebody want to learn, right? And when I think about my time in, in, in Mannheim, they, you, have, you have one exam. It counts 100% of your grade, right? You basically learn 300 pages by heart, and then you sit there for 90 minutes, you write them down, that's it, right? Does that teach me problem solving? That, does that teach me uh, innovative thinking? I don't think so, right? Is that now bad? And is it like, oh, we really don't need that anymore? I'm not sure. It depends on yeah. for which task do you want this person to be to be skilled at, right? And as a university nowadays, you either it has to be Master University or the University of Mannheim, they basically have to think what are the demands in coming from the jobs which our future which our students are having to meet, what are the skills, right? And do the teaching style we have, is the teaching style we have effective in teaching them these skills? That's the question. And if they come to the conclusion, yes, uh, an exam like this one teaches me a certain skill, which is what is demanded from that university, for, from that uh, employer, that's perfect. They can go ahead with that one. But this is a question universities regularly have to ask themselves, right? And another thing is, I wouldn't overestimate the, what, what artificial intelligence can do for us in terms of it maybe, or I'm afraid that some people think, oh, I don't need to learn hard knowledge anymore because I have it all there, right? It's, it's I just Google it and I figured out I used some kind of program and it, and it tells me that one. Because the, what the human can do is it can t contextualize that. It can make sense of that, right? You have a plain certain knowledge but making sense of that. And by making sense of that one, you figure out different angles, you have ideas, you, you, you are innovative, you ask questions, right? You're like, why is that? The ca That's something which I don't see any artificial intelligence is doing. That's something which, which philosophers did, right? Which uh, poets are doing. It, it, it's asking questions. That's something which children are doing, right? Yeah. You ask the child, the child is seeing a moon, and then the moon is going away, and the child is asking, why is the moon away? It's a simple question, right? And now we can explain it, but maybe a few hundred years, a few thousand years ago even, we had people who really wanted to understand why is the moon going yeah. away, right? And I don't see chat GPD answering this question. It can give me maybe the summary of the knowledge we have, right? But can it contextualize it? Can it make sense of that one? Yeah. I don't know. So I wouldn't underestimate the power of just knowing things and having a basic knowledge in something. Uh, reminds me of the quote, um, computers are stupid, they can only give answers. And yeah, questions. I mean, but humans are also stupid sometimes <laughs> in our behavior, that's without any question, but yeah. Yeah. Um, Maybe to, um, to wrap it up, we, we spoke about passion, we spoke about learning, how our surroundings influence our learning, we spoke about uh, dual PhDs. Before we end this episode, is there something, um, one concept you feel very passionate about that you would like to share, one message about learning, about focus or attention, or about uh, our surroundings that, um, yeah, that you would like our future students and current students to know? Mm. So there is a good book, also again by Carl Newport, called Deep Work. And I recommend every person who will do mental tasks, especially on a level where they have to solve problems, where they have to understand think, things, which is like most of the students are doing here um, or like all students are doing here um, to read the book Deep Work 
Why? Because... Could you give us a, a quick summary, perhaps? Yeah, so what, what Carl Newport does is that he, he sees the, and explains the value, the ability to deeply focus on something, right? To, to sit down and have a laser focus on a task makes you understand and learn things quicker and better than if you're always distracted. And that's the complete opposite of what I see now. We are bombarded by notifications on our phone, by social media, by emails, by WhatsApp messages. The whole time something comes in, right? Yeah. So that we don't really sit down and shut our mind off from other outside sources. And I think uh, one of the main reasons why I probably didn't had as good grades as I should have back in my education was because I was not sitting and having deep focus, deep work. Instead, I was constantly distracted by things. And social media makes it for me way different. I deleted my Facebook. I deleted my Instagram account. I don't need it anymore. It gives me no value, right? And it's even worse. It's a decision. It's a personal decision of everybody to keep that, right? I don't say they're necessarily bad, but I want to say everybody to be aware of the negative effects of all these notifications and social media, of what it does with your ability to be focused on one task, to be focused on, I read this paper, I read this book, I write this article, I understand this equation. If you, if you can, and that's what Andrew Huberman is with his podcast is does, doing very good, is if you develop the ability to focus very strongly on one task, like a laser focus on one thing, I, I'm convinced, and that's also what the book wants to tell you from Carl Newport, I'm convinced that you can achieve way more in less time than somebody who wants to learn a textbook chapter but is constantly yeah. distracted by WhatsApp messages. I'm convinced by that. So and I did it myself, and I, do it, I try to do this deep work every day. With your research, perhaps we can in the future better understand how our surroundings influence our ability of deep work. Mm -hmm. um, of course, superficial level, we have social media notifications, but also as we're sitting here in the Tarpine building, light, uh, oxygen levels um, that feel very, um, yeah, just create a good learning environment. Um, I think that's a, yeah, a good thing, a good wrap up perhaps be no. able to focus deeply, um, Practice create deep work. an environment yeah. uh, that facilitates this process. Um, and I believe if you have um, some ending words, some, uh, some last concepts, otherwise. Go, go buy the book Deep Work, Practice Deep Work. That's, uh, that's a thing. And... Uh, yeah, don't, if you are 20, 21, 19, if you are 30 and you think you are lost because you don't enjoy what you are doing or you don't know where your career goes, um, yes, find your passion, right? But uh, maybe more importantly, try to become very good in something and maybe you get enjoyment by being good in something and then you will like it again or you start to like it nice that's a message i think that deeply resonates with a lot of students uh, at least it does for me uh, i'd like to thank you again that you uh, appeared on this podcast um, i think it was a very interesting and a bit different episode um, not only sbe but also fhml and um, yeah the the spirit of interdisciplinary science at maastricht here um, yeah, it was also my first episode on this podcast, so I'm uh, very happy to have had you at a get as my guest. And with that, I'm looking forward yeah, to next week where we'll be looking at uh, AI, ChatGPT. And uh, yeah, have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.